The simplest way to construct the estimate of the treatment effect being studied is to compare the average outcome between the treated group and the matched control group using a difference in means test. As we've mentioned, if there is a concern about time invariant unobservables and the data is available, we could estimate the treatment effect via a diff and diff by taking the difference between the treated and controls post-treatment and subtracting from it the difference between the treated and controls pre-treatment. In both cases, we get an estimated treatment effect and a standard error to use for testing statistical significance. Now let's discuss a paper by Lin and Yi that uses matching to test whether adopting a policy of inflation targeting lowers a developing country's inflation rate. The paper was published in the Journal of Development Economics in 2009. They have 13 countries that adopted an explicit inflation target and 39 other potential control countries. They use a probit equation to estimate the probability of adopting the policy and then match the 13 treated countries to controls based on the propensity score. They restrict their analysis to the region of common support. They construct the treatment effect by comparing average inflation rates between the treated and their matched controls. They report results using both nearest neighbor and kernel matching, and both methods show that inflation targeting policy does cause lower inflation and lower volatility of inflation. So far, so good. The paper's not perfect, though. It doesn't check for covariate balance. Also, it would be possible with their data to estimate the treatment effect via a diff and diff, which would control for unobservable time invariant confounders, but they do not do this either. Ideally, we'd also like to have more than 13 treated units and a richer data set that let us use more covariates to match on, but the paper is great in that it improves on the existing literature on inflation targeting, which did not address selection bias at all. Another matching paper I'd like to discuss is by Jalen and Ravillon, published in the Journal of Business and Economic Statistics in 2003. They studied the effect of an anti-poverty program called Trabajar, or work, in Argentina. The program targeted low-skilled workers by offering a wage of up to $200 US per month for doing work on projects in local communities. For the potential controls, the paper used a huge social survey recently conducted in Argentina that was also administered to about 3,500 participants in the Trabajar program. The survey is very detailed, so the first stage model on the probability of participating in the program has over 100 covariates in it, as opposed to six or seven in the Lin and Yi paper. Jalen and Ravion find the treatment effect of being in the program to be about a 25% increase in family income. Okay, let's sum up what we learned about propensity score matching. First, the idea is to find, for every treated unit, a matched control that is similar as possible to the treated unit. We do this by collapsing similarity down to an estimated probability of treatment variable called the propensity score and use that to match. When estimating our treatment effect, we only want to consider the part of the distribution of treated units that overlaps the distribution of control units, what we call the region of common support. After creating our matches by nearest neighbor or kernel methods, we can compute the treatment effect by comparing the average difference in outcome between the two groups, or by using a diff and diff approach. One important reality checked on the model is covariate balance. That is, on average, the treated and matched control groups should not significantly differ on the values of the covariates used in the first stage model. Matching, especially when combined with diff and diff, is a very useful technique to remove selection bias when estimating treatment effects and observational data. I personally think it is way underrated.